You got me? Can you hear me? All right. <clears throat> I'm nursing a little bit of a cold or something in my throat, so uh, naturally when the opportunity I get to preach, that's going to happen, so um, I apologize for that. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here to share this um, message with you, to trust me with um, uh, speaking from up here. It's not something that I take lightly, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity. My prayer is that <clears throat> this message would encourage us, um, and I say us because I mean all of us. Um, evangelism is a scary word um, for a lot of people, and it is for me as well. People um, have often said, well, man, you just don't have any fear about this stuff, but I'll, no, no, I'm, I'm terrified at times. Um, but I feel like I have tools in my tool belt, and I feel like God has um, worked on things in my own life to where I'm, I'm, I'm able to uh, get through some of that fear. So my, my uh, goal today is to give you some tools to put in your tool belt, because the more equipped you feel uh, going into a situation or going into conversations with people, uh, the more likely you are to do it. Um, the more likely you are to do it, the more opportunity there is for people to know Jesus. And that's really why we're here. There's, there's really no other purpose for existence, in my opinion, than to uh, bring people to Christ. Um, and we're going to qualify that term even a little bit as well today. Um, let's pray, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be here today as your people, that we can gather together in one mind, in one heart, uh, to worship you, to, to meet with you, to meet with one another. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would take the words that are spoken today and those things that are of the Spirit of God would be um, firmly rooted in our hearts and they would grow and they would uh, be nurtured by your Spirit. Um, superintend this time and have your way in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. I've titled this message, Four Stepping Stones in Evangelism or having conversations that count. And for the sake of full disclosure, especially to the millions watching online, um, a lot of this material was first introduced to me through uh, a ministry called Living Waters with Ray Comfort. Um, he's an evangelist with that ministry out of California. So um, I wish I was uh, smart enough to come up with these things on my own, but I've taken these and applied them to my own life and sort of tweaked these out um, from my own experience. Um, but if you want to go deeper and you want some more of that, I can give you that name again. Um, 140,000 people die every 24 hours. That's 5,833 every hour. 97 every minute. Or 1.6 people per second. 1.6 people per second go into eternity. And so the question for us is, what are we doing with that? Are we okay with 1.6 people per second potentially going into a godless eternity? Wow, way to start heavy, <laughs> right? I say that to say, there's a real seriousness to, to this, but the best part about it, as we're going to see, is that all we need to do is walk in the power and the authority that God has already given to us. And so it's not, it's not for condemnation that I brought that up. It's just for reality. This is, what, this is what is going on every day, and we have an opportunity to speak into this. We have an opportunity to do something with this. To, in, to help people enter into an eternity in the presence of God as they were created to do. Um, and so 2% of Christians, this is according to Bill, the late uh, Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. I think it's now called Prue. 2% of Christians actively share their faith. 2%. I want us to be part of that 2% that are actively sharing their faith. So that begs the question, why? Why is it that only 2% of professing Christians actively share their faith? Maybe it's because some people just don't care. 
I, I don't know. I'm not here to judge motives. Um, maybe it's because people feel like maybe they'll mess it up. They might say the wrong thing. I, I know what I believe, and I know what was taught to me when the gospel was presented to me, but wh what if I say the wrong thing? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to connect you with my pastor here. Call him. He, he'll do it, right? Um, I've heard that a lot. I've heard people say, you know, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to have a conversation with someone that can introduce them to Jesus. And so that becomes a barrier. That becomes a reason why we are not actively sharing our faith with people. There's all kinds of other reasons as well. But I think the most common ones that I have heard from people is they don't feel equipped and they're afraid. There's this fear that they'll say the wrong thing or won't cover all the bases. And so we're not going to fix all of that today, but I'm going to give you, hopefully give you a little bit of um, information and some insight into how you might be able to at least get past this barrier and, and work towards being more and more equipped. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says this, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, anytime there's a therefore, you have to ask, what is it there for, right? So it's, it's a follow-up. It's A, so now B. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go and make disciples of all the nations. And I love that word, nations, right, Josh? Nations, all the nations. Sun Prairie is included in that. Stoughton's included in that. Even Madison is included, especially Madison is included in that. Make disciples of all nations. And I love the emphasis here in the church is making disciples, not just converts, not just having to place where people can come and, yeah, we want them to encounter Jesus, but we want to make disciples. We want that lasting, intimate relationship with God that they can then um, uh, tell others about and, and, and so on and so on. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, Jesus says. And he says, because of that, now I commission you. So one of the foundational principles I want us to understand today is that all of this that we're going to learn is in the context of the authority of the believer, is in the context of the authority that Jesus Christ himself has given us. It's not a commission that comes from the pastor as he beats us over the head, share your face, share your face, I want to fill the chairs. No. It, this comes from Jesus himself. These were some of his parting words. So he had so many years of ministry and demonstration, as we're going to see, of preaching the kingdom of God and demonstrations of power. And then he says, I have all the authority. Now I'm commissioning you to go and do likewise. So the foundation of all of this is on the commission that we've been given. Paul uses the term ambassador in his letters. He says, I'm an ambassador, as though God himself is speaking through me. Be reconciled be brought into proper relationship with God himself. So I think it's clear in, in Scripture that salvation, being born again, coming to Christ, and being an ambassador are two sides of the same coin. We cannot separate the two. And so we need to be part, this 2% needs to be 100% of Christians actively sharing their faith. We cannot separate the claim to be a Christian and the lack or the uh, responsibility, the, the authority to share our faith with people. This, the, the two are part and parcel. And so that lays the foundation for what we're going to learn about today. So as I stated, I'm here to encourage you to be obedient to God's command, to evangelize, to go and make. Um, and I want to just offer some um, practical ways to help you feel equipped to do that uh, effectively, the way that Jesus did. Two other important verses, I think, uh, that help build this foundation out. 1 Peter 3.15, In your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Always be prepared. There's, there's an intentionality to this thing. 
Uh, well, I'm not sure what to say to someone about sharing my faith. Okay, what are you doing about that? Are you being intentional in learning methods and learning things that you can do to help start conversations with people, to um, help answer the hard questions that people have at work? I mean, we, this massacre that, that Jill just prayed for, people have questions already. I mean, the Internet's just blowing up. Where's God and all this? And, you know... Are we prepared to at least engage with people along these lines? You don't have to have all the answers, as we'll see, but are we at least prepared? Are we being intentional, setting our, the posture of our hearts before God in a place where we can be used to always be prepared to give a defense for the hope that we have? So again, that's part of the foundation. We have the authority, we have the commission, and now our responsibility is to posture ourselves before God in such a way that we are prepared to, um, to give an answer. Jude 3 says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. So there's this idea of contending for the faith. There's a lot of ideas out there about what it means to be a Christian. Are we prepared to contend for the faith? Are we prepared to help correct uh, misunderstandings um, and ideas? When we first got to India, um, and I would meet people in the market, or we'd talk to families in our apartment building, and they assumed, number one, because we were white Americans, that we were Christians. Because they think everybody in America is a Christian. And to them... At the time, the show's not even on anymore, I don't think, but Baywatch and beer were the two things that they equated with American Christians. And so there were some cultural assumptions, which we're going to learn about a little bit there, that we kind of helped sort of guide them through and think, well, that's not exactly what it means. Um, But, you know, I can see where you'd get that impression, certainly. Um, I had, I'm not on Facebook anymore, but I used to interact with some friends from high school that... Um, used to like to rail on on Christianity, and they said, you know, one of the comments one time, it had nothing to do with politics, but he's like, Dish, I know that you're a, um, I know that you're a Republican, you know, right-wing, evangelical, this and that, just because I, I said I worship Jesus on my page. But the assumption was, because I'm a Christian in America, that he knew how I voted politically, he knew what my stances on all these different things were. Well, that's, that's not the case. And so there's a lot of these clear misunderstandings of things, and we need to contend for the faith. Often Christians are known for what they're against more than for what we actually stand for. And so there's this idea of contending for the faith, not in an obnoxious way, but as it says in First Peter, gentleness and respect. But it's a very real battle of worldviews and minds and and, and thinking philosophies that are going on out there. And so we need to be at least aware of that and prepared. So Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom. He reasoned about spiritual things with both the religious and non-religious people uh, of his day. And his message was validated with demonstrations of power, healings and signs and wonders and exorcisms. It validated the ministry uh, that he proclaimed. And ultimately, the resurrection of Jesus was the vindication of what Jesus was about. So as disciples of Christ, we're we're called to follow this example and to do likewise. And so that's really the goal of today. So having said that, if you could turn to John chapter 4, I want to suggest that there's four stepping stones or guides that we can use that we see in John chapter 4 that can help guide us through conversations and interactions with people um, anywhere, anytime. doesn't matter who they are. Um, When Sims Exteriors and Remodeling hired me, they did not know what they were getting into. But I have used this on almost every employee that I've worked with at that place. Um, And I spent uh, Friday... I spent 
all day with a, a new employee. He was working with me. And I don't think there was more than probably 20 minutes, other than when we were working, <laughs> that Jesus wasn't the topic of conversation. And it's not because I'm exceptional or anything like that, although my wife thinks that I am. But um, it's because I've, I've used these so much that it, it, it just, I almost can't help myself. So these tools are powerful, this, these stepping stones. It's not a formula, but it's a guide. And um, it, it's just incredible, um, helpful, because in and of myself, I have nothing to offer. But it's Jesus, it's, it's Christ Jesus, the hope in me. And this is a simple way to, to help us. John chapter 4. Um, most of you be familiar with this. Um, <clears throat> it's Jesus' interaction with the Samaritan woman. We're going to read a little bit of it, and um, then we'll, we'll pull out some, some key uh, verses here. Um, let's just skip down um, verse 3. The Lord uh, left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. So he's traveling back to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria, verse 4. Verse 5, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near a plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph's, uh, Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Um, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Here's the first stepping stone. Number one, relate. Right? Simple. Jesus related to the woman, a complete stranger, by saying what? Do you want to burn in hell for eternity? <laughs> no. That would be incredibly obnoxious, and you'd probably get punched, and you should. But what did he do? He was sitting by a well. She was coming to draw water. What did he do? He asked for a glass of water. And what, is that, what does that do? It yeah, gives an opportunity for a conversation. It gives an opportunity to interact. Now, this was, this was an exceptional uh, situation because the Jews and Samaritans did not have anything to do with each other. And even more uh, bizarre was the fact that a Jewish male was speaking to a Samaritan woman. Even more than that, a Samaritan woman who came out during that time of the day when no one else was around, and there was a reason for that. So already all kinds of you know, bells and whistles are going off in this interaction. But he doesn't start with the spiritual right away. He just simply asks her, can I have a glass of water? And it makes sense because they're by the well. Now if they were out in the middle of the desert and he said, hey, can I have some water? Well, that would be a little odd. So I think the first point is understanding where you're at and just, just be observant, be discerning. Ask the Spirit of God, hey, I'm going to work today. I've driven this route so many hundreds of times. It's mundane, whatever. But God, can you open my eyes to an opportunity today to have a conversation with someone? Maybe at the water cooler. Maybe working on a project together. Maybe your attention's drawn to someone who seems to be particularly stressed out or upset that morning. I mean, you maybe don't even know them. But hey, how you doing? How was your weekend? Or anything can be a starter to relate to someone. So Jesus took advantage of the opportunity that he had. He probably was thirsty too, traveling. So he asked her for a glass of water. Asking for help from someone is probably the best way to relate to them, I have found, especially if they're a stranger. It's a great way to relate to them, to gain their confidence, to gain an opportunity to talk to them. Why? Because you're not just going up to them and, and making a truth proposition at them or just coming at them with something. You are actually putting yourself in a position where I need some help from you. And that empowers that person, that disarms that person, if you will, and puts them in a position of control or, you know, you know what I mean? You're asking something from them. Now, don't ask them for their wallet. 
you know, something like that. But, you know, giving them an opportunity to actually help you with something then brings a real connection. Um, I, can you help me lift this box into my house? I think actually Pastor Craig, we were talking a little bit this week, and he shared how he had done that with uh, someone that he knows as well, asked, asked for their help for something, and, and it was a way to just connect. And so I think that's a, real, that's a powerful way to do that. Um, so the first one is relate. Jesus relates to this woman by asking her for something to drink. Her response, she says in verse 9, You are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Then Jesus says to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Here is stepping stone number two, create. Here Jesus is creating an opportunity to transition the conversation from the natural into the spiritual. And all he's doing is responding to the response of the Samaritan woman. She's puzzled. Why are you, a Jew, asking me, a Samaritan, for something? And this gives him the opportunity to then say, well, actually, if you knew what was really happening right now, you would be asking me to give you eternal life, the water that you would never have to drink from or never have to take and draw from again, the well of salvation, right? Uh, How does he actually say it? Uh, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, she's still thinking in the natural here, because she says, well, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself? as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds. So she's not quite connecting yet with what Jesus is doing, but this transition is now taking place, where he's transitioning into the spiritual. Now, one of the, one of the most effective ways, again, of helping people transition from the natural to the spiritual is by asking questions. There's a great book I would highly recommend called Tactics by Greg Kokel, K-O-U-K-L, Kokel. And the whole book is about how you can talk with anybody about anything by asking questions, getting them to open up. And, and a lot of times that's way more effective than telling someone what they're doing wrong or that they need Jesus. Asking questions and using stepping stones like this to help guide people in a conversation helps them come to the realization of their own need for God. And then you are there to reveal, which is our fourth step, and bring the revelation of God and what he did through Jesus to them. So asking questions is a great way to, um, to bring up spiritual things in a conversation. It helps people open up within their general assumptions. Let's look at Luke 18 real quick. And we just see a, an example of where Jesus does this. In Luke 18, it's an interaction that Jesus has with, with the rich young ruler, now, this, this could preach on its own, but um, I was told to be done by two, so I'm not going to have a lot of time. Um, but verse 18 says, um, <clears throat> what does it say? It, oh, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, if someone came up to you and said, hey, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? What's the first thing you would do? You would start telling them maybe the four points of the gospel or telling them about Jesus and that, you know, how he died on the cross for their sins and you know, they need to confess and repent. And you'd be right, but what does Jesus actually do here? He comes back with a question. Why do you call me good? No one's good but God alone. And then he goes on, you know the commandments, this and that. What was he doing? He was challenging the rich young ruler's assumption that he actually understood what it meant to be good and that being good was good enough to get you to heaven. So instead of answering a question that wasn't actually the question that needed to be answered, Jesus asked so he could dig a little bit more and get a little bit more of the understanding of where this guy really is. I run into a lot of people, I believe in God. Oh, I automatically assume they understand God the way I do. You can't assume that anymore. 
I mean, even the concept of eternal life, um, I think it, I was just reading in a book, uh, Prince Harry, was it? Yeah, Prince Harry said, yeah, I, I believe in eternal life. People live on in the thoughts of those who are still li- alive. That's eternal life. People never die because they live on in the, th- in the thoughts of other people. Oh, that's not exactly what I think of when I say eternal life. So we can't, we can't assume that terminology is the same. Even the idea of a Christian. I like to say I'm a follower of Christ. I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. Because what does Christian mean? I'm a white, Republican. You, you know what I mean? They, they can box me into all these things, right? Um, and so asking questions helps people open up within their general assumptions. Um, and so Jesus asks a question here. He gets down to the root of the issue that the rich young ruler already came to him with the posture of, I know I'm good. So he's, in calling God, uh, Jesus the good teacher, he's saying, oh, I recognize good because I'm good. So, hey, good teacher, wink, wink. What must I do to have eternal life? You know, saying it for the sake of those around him so they could hear. But Jesus, he challenges that. And so asking questions is a great way to get people to open up that way. We can also help them open up within cultural assumptions. And this is a big one, especially when you're um, working, living overseas, or uh, even in, well, even in the U.S., it's a cultural melting pot of, of people from all over the world. Um, a cultural assumption is a premise or a belief that is assumed to be true in one culture, but may not be accepted from the perspective of a different culture. Now, in 22, uh, Matthew 22, 15, Jesus has asked pretty much a yes or no question. Um, about paying taxes to Caesar, the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity, that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. They're buttering him up before they set the trap. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? And then goes on to give them an explanation. He's asked a yes or no question, but he recognizes that this is what's called a faulty dilemma, where giving an answer yes is wrong and giving the answer no is wrong. It would be like if someone asked you, does your mother know that you're stupid? (laughs) Well, if I say yes, I'm stupid and my mom knows it. If I say no, I'm still stupid, but mom just doesn't know it, right? How, how are you supposed to answer that? So Jesus, recognizing it's a trap, challenges their cultural assumptions that paying taxes to Caesar is unholy. And rather, he turns it back on them and, and calls them out for it. But again, asking questions, digging deeper with someone is a great way to help people open up within their general and cultural assumptions. And answering the wrong question is always the wrong answer. And so sometimes it's easy for us to just come with an answer to something, but we really need to dig a little bit deeper and, and really see what's behind that question, what's at the, the foundation, what's at the root of that question. And as we see also in Matthew 22, it helps expose faulty logic. In this case, it was a faulty dilemma. He was, he was in trouble no matter what way he answered. And so that really wasn't, I mean, Matthew tells us the intent of those asking the question. Someone you're talking to who wants to trap you isn't going to tell you they're trying to trap you. They will just try to do it, and it happens a lot. I've learned the hard way with this one quite a bit. Um, but that's all about, that's, that's how it is, contending for the faith and bringing the message to them. So by exposing their faulty logic, in this case, Jesus forced them to question their own question. And then he was able to um, guide the the conversation the way it needed to go. So we we relate, we create, and one of the ways we can create effectively is by asking questions. 
defining terms. What is it you mean by this? Or I'm not sure I quite understand that. Can you explain that a little bit more to me? And one of the things you'll find is that they, a lot of people claim to believe a certain thing, but when it comes down to it, they, they don't really believe it, at least consistently. Or they're not really even sure. There's cliches, there's memes, there's little taglines and everything that, you know, these little sayings that people in the culture put out there. But really, let's dig into that a little bit and see if that's really how you live and really what you believe. The next stepping stone is convict. And <clears throat> he says, uh, after she asks him, are you greater than Jacob, who gave us this well? In verse 13, Jesus says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw. So she's, she's intrigued now. She's, she's hungry. She's seeing, okay, there, there's something else going on here. There's something bigger at play here. And he says to her, well, go call your husband and come back. Here it is. Now she has to deal with the reality of her lifestyle and her choices. She has to deal with the fact that whatever it is she's been doing so far just isn't working. She's had five husbands, and the one that she's with now isn't her husband. Now, we don't, we don't convict because we condemn. We're not trying to show people, well, you're a dirty, rotten sinner. They are, and so are we. We just happen to be saved because we've repented, we've acknowledged our sin before God, and God has saw fit to save us. That's it. That's the only difference. And so asking questions, especially here, is helpful. <laughs> There's a method that I could teach you some other time where you actually get people to admit that they're, that they're sinners and that if God judged them according to the standard in Scripture, they'd be found guilty. You don't even have to say it. Just by asking questions, you can get them to admit that. Now, is that just a, a trick, a neat game we can play? No. But if I tell someone, you're a sinner and you need to get right with God, they're going to put the walls up, they'll probably leave, they'll be mad at you, right? It's offensive. The gospel is offensive enough on its own. We don't have to add to it. So if we can help people see this on their own, right, we're not compromising the truth that they are sinners before God and that when they're living their lives void of the Spirit of God, they're not making good choices and their life is probably going to be a mess. Whatever it is they've been doing so far, whatever worldview they've embraced or the way they live, Obviously, in this woman, it's, it's, it's not working. So in order to get to the reveal part, in, or in order for them to receive the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they've got to understand the problem first. And they are the problem. We are the problem. Jesus saves us from ourself as much as he does sin. And so here is the point where he brings conviction. She says, uh, uh, or he says to her, or she says, I have no husband. He says, you're right. The fact is you've had five, and the man you're with now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. And she's like, whoa. Verse 19, I can see you're a prophet. I've had experiences where I've been speaking to someone, and it hasn't been going well. Then all of a sudden, I don't know if it's a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, and it's like I just, their heart is just opened up and I see exactly what's going on and I just, I speak to that. And it just turns everything. And that person cannot deny. Is that, has anyone ever had that experience when speaking to someone? Yeah. It's powerful. And it's not you. It certainly isn't me. It's the Spirit of God. It's that authority that has been given to us as believers. And so she's getting it now. She's like, whoa, there's something going on here. I perceive you're a prophet. And then what she portrays here in verse 20, our father 
Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. The Jews claim that that place is where they worship. She's, she's connecting with whatever sort of religious background information she has. Now she's sort of grasping for, well, this is the understanding I have. We worship on this mountain and worship on that mountain. And Jesus is able to then take that and say, actually, it doesn't matter where you're worshiping. One is coming where you worship in spirit and truth. So he's moving to the next step. So there's that conviction of sin. The fact is that the spirit of God is in the earth to convince, to convict men of sin, judgment, and righteousness. So sin is a problem. For a long time in evangelism, the teachings and the, the books or whatever, the trend was not to use the word sin. Use the word mistake. Use the word <coughs> false, whatever. Sin is what it is, man. It's sin. You do it. I do it. Everybody does it. God presented a solution to the problem of sin. That's it. That's the good news. And so we relate, we create, we convict, or we look for an opportunity to help bring the knowledge of sin so that there can be repentance. And finally, reveal. Jesus reveals to her the answer to her or to all of humanity's sin problem. And we see that in verses 21 through 26. Um, Believe me, woman, a, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do know. Again, challenging some cultural and religious assumptions about where to worship, how to worship, right? He's, he's kind of addressing all of these. Um, you worship what you do not know. Salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. Then she says, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain it to us. Here's the moment of revelation. I, who speak to you, I am he. And now her eyes are opened. I'm in the presence of the Messiah. And now I have to respond. And she could walk away and reject. Or... She can do what she does, and she goes and tells everybody, which, again, just confirms when you come into relationship with Christ, the natural outcome or outworking of that is to go and tell, to go and make disciples. And so this was the moment of revelation when her eyes were open, and she received the spiritual truths that Jesus was sharing with her. And I know what you're thinking. Well, this is Jesus. Of course he maneuvered her the right way. But you know, plenty of people saw Jesus do signs and wonders and miracles and walked away. And he didn't go after them necessarily. So was that unsuccessful? No. The seed took in those that it took. And it didn't in others. But if we're not getting the seed out there, then no one has an opportunity for it. Right? It's God who brings the harvest. It's the Spirit of God who's in the earth to convince and con convict men of sin, judgment, and righteousness. It's ours is the, is the privilege to spread seed. And so there's tools, there's ways we can do that in a way that is uh, winsome, with gentleness and respect. So in conversations, and this can be a conversation that happens all at once, or this can be steps that are used throughout conversations over time. Um, I did not get it in the notes this time. In fact, I found it afterwards, and I forgot about it. But in the, is it on the website? On the website and in the sort of the midweek review or whatever, there's going to be a website in there for Crosswalk. Um, I think it's um, crosswalk.com, how to turn a conversation to spiritual things. The steps there, it's worded a little bit differently than what we learned today, but it's Perfect, in my opinion. These are not, this is not a formula. These are steps. And so I may have 15 minutes with someone, and I can go through all the steps. I may work with someone, and I, I, I've only gone one and two, and I can't quite get to three, so we've got to spend some more time on two. Because remember, it's not just about conquering that person for conversion. It's about that person, and it's about Jesus, right? So we have to watch for that a little bit. 
But hopefully these are some tools that you can put in your toolbox, your tool belt, that can help you be part of the 2% of Christians who actively share their faith. And I just want to close with um, two thoughts. Charles Spurgeon, um, a famous Baptist minister from London, was asked by a young Christian, <clears throat> and this is a little dated, okay, we don't use the word heathen anymore, but will the heathen who have not heard the gospel be saved? And he responded, it is more a question with me whether we who have the gospel and fail to give it to those who have not can be saved. Whoa. I'm not saying that's the position I take, but it really got me thinking. It really got me thinking. Jim Elliott uh, is a missionary to the Aka Indians in Ecuador. Uh, at the time when he was there, 1956, um, actually that's when he was martyred in 56, but between his time at Wheaton College in 1948 and 1956, he spent time in the unexplored jungles of Ecuador. He wrote this prayer down in his journal while he was a student at Wheaton. And I think this is a prayer I've prayed many times, and it's something that um, you can say amen to today if you want to. God, I pray thee, light these idle sticks of my life, and may I burn for thee. Consume my life, my God for it is thine. I seek not a long life, but a full one, like you, Lord Jesus. Most of the Aka tribe are Christians today because he gave his life. Light these idle sticks of my life, may I burn for thee. I don't know if I know what I'm asking with that. So be encouraged today to share your faith. If there's any condemnation, that is not from the Spirit of God. This message is meant to be an encouragement. It's meant to stir us up. We are called to stir one another up. And it's as much of a stirring for myself as it is for anyone else. And finally, I would be, it would be negligent of me, I think, to give a message on sharing the gospel if I did not give an opportunity for those who are here who don't know Jesus, um, it, it's simple. The reality of sin in our life has separated us from our Creator God. And there's absolutely nothing we can do in and of ourselves, no amount of good works, no amount of paying tithes or money or anything that can bridge that gap that sin has created. And God, out of His love, out of His mercy for us, went ahead and took care of that problem by sending Jesus. You can think of the cross as a way to bridge from God to man. His death on the cross paid the penalty from sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the person of Jesus, is eternal life. And the Bible calls us to repentance, to acknowledge our sin before God, and to receive the grace that he gives us. And when we do that, and we invite the Spirit of God to take residency, to live inside of us, our spirit connects with the Holy Spirit. The Bible calls that being born again. And we're a brand new creature. Not, it, it hasn't, we haven't existed before. There's a whole new quality of life and a whole new reality in Jesus. And now we are connected to our God and to one another. So if you have never done that or some of that sounds a little bit strange to you, uh, my guess would be that uh, you, you haven't asked the Lord uh, into your life. And so this, today's an opportunity to do that. You don't have to understand everything. Just understand that you are a sinner in need of God's saving grace because that's where all of us started. And so talk to me, talk to someone who brought you, talk to pastor, the elders, and um, we can pray with you on Amen.